Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, or even evening, depending where you are. Welcome to another ESCO webinar on measuring the economic situations and the economy in different aspects. And here with a COVID-19 focus. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sanjeev Mahajan. I work for the Office for National Statistics in the Economic Statistics area and have been for a while as the head of methods and research engagement. Today, we're going to be focusing on free goods and economic welfare. We all use in our everyday lives to various degrees, goods, services, apps, etc., that are free. This presentation and work covers the welfare, welfare dimension and the valued us as consumers place on these type of products our willingness to pay and how much we may be willing to pay if we had to pay is derived information and evidence from specific surveys and studies before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. The presentation will be around 40 minutes and we'll have, if you want to have any points for clar clarification in the chat, please do. But questions and answers will be at the end and there'll be ample time 15 to 20 minutes for questions and answers. This is being recorded and the presentation itself will be placed on the ESCO website thereafter. So thank you very much in advance to the speakers. So I will hand over to David, who's from the National Institute of Economic Social Research and Economic Research and ESCO, and Diane Coyle, who's from the University of Cambridge as well as ESCO and his an ONS fellow. So I'll hand over to David and Diane and off we go. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for the introduction, Sanjeev. And I need Sarah to stop my video for me. Um, so uh, hello everybody and thanks very much for joining us today. Um, this is a piece of work that we started quite some time before the pandemic hit, but we were lucky enough to be able to um, uh, also look at the, at the effects of changes during the pandemic, as I'll come on to explain. The um, mo original motivation was that there isn't any settled way to treat the measurement of digital goods that are free in the sense that the users, the consumers or businesses don't pay directly for the services that they are using. Now, obviously these services um, all involve marketed activities, both in the production and consumption of them, but um, the, the, the treatment of how the free aspect is measured in the national accounts and um, also the wider questions about economic welfare um, are not, uh, there's no settled approach to it. There have been a number in the literature. So for example, Leonard Nakamura and uh, John Samuels and Rachel Soloveitchik took an approach of looking at a, a, a barter um, a, a analysis of these in the national accounts. We were interested in exploring further the question about the additional consumer welfare that came from the provision of these free goods. Uh, David's driving the slides. If we can go on to the next one, please, David. Uh, trying to assign a welfare value to free goods isn't uh, a new issue. Obviously, there's a very large literature about how do you do these valuations when there are no market prices in the environmental economics or the cultural economics literature and, and some very good surveys of this. We followed up on a method um, uh, f uh, that first came to attention um, by Eric Brynjolfsson and his co-authors this one and other papers looking at contingent valuation approaches to estimate the size of the consumer surplus from these, these free digital products. And this obviously sits in the growing debate about um, the role of uh, GDP and other assessments of economic welfare. And here on this slide, we refer to the paper by Richard Hayes and colleagues, um, painting this as a spectrum from narrow measures of market activity through GDP to broader measures of economic welfare. So we're in the territory of looking at those broader measures and um, not only estimating them at a moment in time, but because we could run the survey twice, looking at changes in those valuations too. 
so that gave us a, a natural experiment. There's obviously quite a lot of controversy about the contingent valuation literature and uh, what sort of weight you can put on the numbers that come out of the surveys and a large literature about how to conduct these appropriately. In the end, I come down in the camp of thinking that we need to find some empirical approaches to these questions. And if these um, are considered not to be the right methods, then critics need to come up with different methods. And as I hope you'll see during this presentation, we think that you can gain quite a lot of insight from it. There are now a few other papers looking at contingent valuation of free digital goods in the United States, uh, particularly focusing on Facebook. We wanted to explore the um, UK empirics, obviously. We also wanted to look at other free goods, not just digital ones, and compare the digital valuations to marketed substitutes and also to explore some distributional questions. So as this slide is going to show, uh, we spend an awful lot of time online these days. Here are just uh, some of the figures that come from um, Ofcom and other sources. Uh, this is obviously um, increased more during um, the pandemic as more and more people have started to work online and socialize online. I think the figure I found most striking uh, there's another Ofcom figure that showed that um, in the last full year, so before the pandemic, the average time spent online was a full day a week, 24 hours in one week. And so this is actually a really um, important empirical question. To get at the distributional questions that we wanted to explore, we um, took the route of using a YouGov survey rather than online surveys that have been used in um, other papers. And um, uh, this slide just says that we um, had a sample that was representative of the UK online population. Uh, there is obviously an offline population, and so the results need to be interpreted with that caution in mind. Uh, but otherwise, the sample is, is representative, and we can explore um, age, um, education, income, gender, and uh, region and political, uh, some political indicators as well. Uh, when we get to the results part, David is going to talk a, a bit about that. One of the challenges in doing the surveys is um, uh, questions like anchoring effects. And so we spent quite a lot of time piloting the um, approach that we wanted to take. So we had five rounds of pilots um, over quite a long period, testing different time periods, um, and as the slide says, we were looking to see whether there were any inconsistencies in um, discounting. Um, were, um, were these larger for free goods than for, <clears throat> for paid for goods? We wanted to try and avoid the anchoring effects. We wanted to test what level of category of goods to ask about because that isn't obvious. And that's something that we'll come back to a bit later in the presentation. But the encouraging thing about the surveys was that we got results that seemed sensible and uh, were broadly consistent across the different pilot waves and types of uh, uh, good categories, goods categories that we included. And also um, consistency in, in the ranking of goods. And one of the lessons I take from this is that actually the information about rankings is really quite useful. Uh, we um, posed these as willingness to accept questions. How much would you be willing to accept for the loss of um, this, whatever good it is for a certain time period? If we can go on, the next slide shows the structure of the questionnaires that people faced when they did the YouGov you good survey, um, you surveys. It's well known in the literature that willingness to accept valuations are always larger than willingness to pay valuations. And again, that's something that we'll come back to in the results section and um, typically willingness to accept is very much larger than willingness to pay in the context of free goods than, than in the context of marketed goods and um, that's one of the questions that I think comes out of this methodology. We um, selected products based on the number of time that people spent on them and the number of users that they had and as the slide builds you'll see that we wanted to compare some marketed categories to online categories and some free to um, to paid for and some offline to online 
So for example, here um, in um, uh, uh, the printed newspapers versus online news would be one example, or we've got free access to programming versus the BBC versus the subscription um, radio and TV versus the Netflix and Spotify over there. And um, so hopefully we'll get, we're hoping to get some insights from these different comparisons. Um, as an example of a purely offline public good, we also included public parks, which turned out to be quite interesting in the context of the lockdown and the second wave that we were able to do. Um, and then finally from me, before I hand over to David, that did give us a natural experiment to look at changes in valuations. And so here's the timeline. Our first wave was right at the end of February and beginning of March. Um, the lockdown occurred later in March and we were able to um, run a second wave, same questionnaire, smaller sample in May in the midst of the um, UK national lockdown. And we're hoping to do um, another one year on wave early next year. I'm now going to hand over to David to talk about um, what results we got. Thank you very much, Diane, for, for setting us, uh, setting the seat and kicking us off on, on, on this topic. And um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk to some, some of the results here, and uh, there's going to be much more um, in, in, in the paper, obviously, which, which will be coming out as a working paper um, very soon. So um, here on this slide, basically, um, as Diane just mentioned, we, we ran this survey twice. So um, once at the end of February and once in the beginning of, of May. So there's around a 10 week difference. And you know, you wouldn't usually expect huge changes in, um, in the usage of different um, online or offline goods um, among like a month, uh, two months and a half. But um, actually, um, due to the, the lockdown conditions where certain um, online goods suddenly became much more important and offline just became um, um, uh, not, not an option anymore. Um, it's actually quite interesting to see how, how large the changes in terms of um, usage were. And here people were asked to consider the next uh, 12 months. So um, you could see, for example, that the usage of, um, of certain goods uh, went up. So for example, um, as expected, Facebook, WhatsApp, Messenger, and so on, obviously Netflix, Skype, uh, but also interestingly, the use of online grocery shopping and online learning tools um, went up quite significantly over that, that period of time. On the other hand, obviously other goods were used less. So that includes printed newspapers, um, radio, which we think is uh, related to commuting patterns, um, as well as Google Maps, because if you're not moving around as much, then obviously you're not using Google Maps as much. So it's just um, already quite interesting and showed us that actually there's some action in the data that we could you could exploit um, because of, of, of these uh, of, of these kind of sudden changes that no one really anticipated, um, certainly at the beginning of, of, of the year. And it might tell us something about where we're heading in the future if, if you know, some of these substitutions continue. That's something that we, we definitely want to have an eye on. Okay, um, I'm going to give you three examples here of three different types of goods. Um, um, as I mentioned, we asked about, about, about around 30 of them. Um, I'm going to focus on, on Facebook, public parks, and online search, because um, those, I think, are quite interesting, and we have some references in other studies that we can compare that to. Starting with Facebook on the left-hand side here has around the usage of 75% in the UK online population, which is around 90% almost of the population. And you can see this is the kind of um, data we would get, even though our response is at the individual level, and we ask around 10,000 individuals. Um, we, we can we can basically aggregate those in terms of the share of respondents that would choose um, a certain amount of money in order to give up access to to a certain good or um, a service, and that's quite important um, because obviously, if you would ask someone how much would you pay me to continue using Facebook, they would say, well, probably nothing or maybe a little bit uh, because I'm not paying for it right now. So twisting that and doing that the other way around was, was a key insight that we got from, from the literature in the US. Um, we actually say, okay, how much um, would I have to pay you to give up access to, to, to Facebook for a certain period of time? And we played around with, 
with the time period randomly as well. And um, so basically these are different valuation bands that we get and from them we can calculate basically what's the average value that people in this case for the next 12 months would attach to using Facebook and it's around 1,200 almost 1,300 pounds um, for one year. Um, the valuations are much higher for public parks. Um, it's almost around 2,000 pounds uh, per year that people attach to them. So the average person would demand 1,950 pounds in order not to be able to go um, to the park. And it's important to stress here that these figures are pre-lockdown. So this is uh, end of February. And then lastly, on the right-hand side, online search, um, which as we all know is mainly Google, um, it has an average valuation of around 3,000 100 pounds. Now, the interesting thing here is that the median is obviously much lower because there's a certain share of people that are not using um, these at all. But it also tells us that there's a certain amount of people that really value these types of goods and services really, really highly. Um, so, so the median mean differences already shows quite some interesting um, uh, insights in, in, into, um, into these because as I'll show you later uh, on, on in two slides, um, they're not, it's, it's not always um, the same share between mean and media, but actually um, it, it depends a bit on, on, on the good that the mean and median are, might be much closer together for some of them as, as for others. You can see that almost 100% actually. So this is pretty much the internet for many people um, means Google, right? So if you go to the internet, you often start start off by typing something in that, that search bar. Now, for us, the problem obviously is which value do we choose within those, right? You could see the first basket here is one to a hundred pounds. So, you know, when we do our calculations, then do I assume that someone who chooses one to a hundred pounds per year, does that person have a hundred pounds in mind, 50 pounds, 70, or just one? And so we kind of try different things. And the values I'll show you here are very conservative in the way that we chose um, the, the, lowest, um, the lowest value within these valuation bands. So we'd assume someone that chooses one to 100 would be willing to, to, um, to give up access for, for one pound. Okay, so here um, we just show you, we, we plotted basically um, the usage rate, or in that case, the non-usage rate, so that the share of people that are not using a certain, uh, a certain good. Um, and the mean valuation of that good. You can kind of see, um, it's a bit counterintuitive, but as, you, as the non-usage rate decreases, so we're moving from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, um, the valuation goes up, okay? So I can show you which ones these are. You can see here, personal email, online search, and, and the physical TV set at home. Those have very high average valuation in, in, in the population um, in, in the UK. Um, and um, almost everyone uses them, okay? So there, there's a high, high degree of correlation, it's around um, 84% um, uh, between those. And interestingly, it looks like there's even a nonlinear pattern here. So as you kind of increase the, the usage of, of a certain good, you can see that the valuations go up, but they seem to be going up um, even more as we're, as we're approaching almost universal um, usage. And, you know, th there's some, some speculation you can think about um, network effects and the importance obviously of of those within many digital goods so if you think about email if you're the only person in the world using it there's not much much use to it but as almost everyone is starting to use email at some point the valuations become very high and this is some of the power of, of the digital economy or behind many of these digital goods um, that is driving some of these um, th these effects that we see here if you're wondering down here, that City Mapper, it's a kind of local transport um, app, uh, mainly used in big cities um, and not available everywhere. So, you know, at, in line with our expectation, usage is very low, and that's why average valuations um, are also um, quite low. It doesn't mean that there's a certain number of users which might have very high, um, very high, we can see that uh, valuations. We can see that, for example, with Snapchat, uh, uh, as I might show you later on. Okay. Getting to demand elasticities, move this video out of the way here. Um, as I said before, mean valuations are on average much higher than, than a median. So that means some people have very high um, 
valuations. So if we plot those um, values that I showed you before um, as, as demand curves, we can see that you know the elasticity is different. So, some of them um, are uh, more elastic or more inelastic than, than others. And, and so um, that's quite interesting. And please note that this is a log scale here, obviously, else there would be um, uh, much more looking like a curve. And um, you can kind of see if we do, we, we plotted those in the, around a number of uh, things. So Facebook, for example, is, is fairly inelastic, but not as much as online search, for example, which is increasing at a much um, uh, lower rate. So in that sense, you know, as you start offering people more and more money, um, some of them will be giving up access, but you know, the rate is decreasing um, at a slower pace for online search as opposed to Facebook, for example. And, you know, other more specialist uh, services might be decreasing at a much higher rate. So, you know, online search is a fairly inelastic, um, it's a fairly inelastic online good. You know, it, it starts to take serious amounts of money to, to offer people to stop using it. And the same applies, for example, um, to um, physical TV sets or uh, personal email. So those, those three seem to be the most uh, valued goods among, uh, among those in our survey, at least. So I can show you here um, some of the median valuations again for, for February. You can see on um, personal email seems to be valued the highest for, for people, not just um, on average, but actually even the median person attaches very high values to personal email. And the reason we, we coined it here as personal email is that we don't want people to think necessarily about um, you know, email as, 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 um, as a tool that is needed to, to, to perform your work. So obviously then, you know, the, we tried that, but then the valuations would approach uh, basically your annual income because, um, you know, you, you couldn't do your job if you wouldn't have access to email at all. So that's why we termed this as personal email here. It's still quite high. It's around uh, two to 5,000 pounds per year that the, the median person attaches to that. But then it decreases quite rapidly. You, you see, if you move to the left hand side, for a lot of these um, digital goods, so we have Spotify and and Twitter. I mean, I do understand why uh, mobile games or Instagram and so on. Um, you can see the median person is actually not willing to pay, uh, willing to sorry to accept anything, um, to give, giving up access. Um, so sorry, they would accept um, a very low amounts of money um, to to give up access to um, to any of of those. And then we're increasing as we go through printed newspapers, it's around 100, uh, up to 100 pounds, um, WhatsApp up to 200, um, and then public parks, which you could see public, public parks have quite high average um, valuation, but it also has high median valuation. So again, I think um, that's, that's quite an interesting one because Facebook, you know, on average seems to have a um, a high valuation, but you know the median is much lower in in, in that case. Okay, I won't bore you with all of, uh, all of those. There's quite a lot of interesting stuff going on across those, and we explain those in, in in the paper. And also, as I mentioned, we kind of compare them directly, kind of offline and online news, for example. And there's quite an interesting, uh, quite a lot of interesting dynamics in terms of changes as well um, as we move through th through the pandemic. Um, since we have very detailed socioeconomic characteristics on all of the um, individuals, so we have age, gender, income, and so on, region, um, we can start digging into those. And there's really quite some interesting things um, that we find. You know, some of them are very intuitive. So younger people tend to value online or digital goods more. So Snapchat, Instagram, Spotify, and so on, sometimes, you know, buy up to 50 times more than, than let's say, people age 50 and above. Um, but other things are valued more by, by older people that includes newspapers, radio, and, and physical TV sets, but interestingly also online grocery shopping, right? So that, that's obviously, um, you know, um, internet-based, but, you know, it seems to be um, mainly um, or high, valued higher by, by people that, that are older here. And as I'll show you later on, we ran some regressions and we also control for, um, for differences or characteristics such as income and education. Um, however, you know, it's quite interesting to see that, you know, for some of those goods, the differences seem to be quite minimal. So if you think about Amazon Marketplace, email, um, online banking, eBay, um, as well as Facebook, actually there's almost 
no difference in terms of if you're old or, or young, in terms of how much um, how much um, value how high your valuation is for for certain goods. So we found those um, quite quite interesting. Then we compared uh, valuations by by gender. So we compare here the the ratio of of male to female um, valuations, and I think that's confirming quite a lot of um, anecdotal evidence that you know people have uh, been talking about in 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 the media and so on. Um, for example, that you know, women tend to attach higher valuations to um, to Instagram or or, or Facebook. Um, but here we see it's also for uh, for, for gaming actually, um, uh, online ride hailing, so apps um, well, you can use to call a cab, for example, um, as well as WhatsApp. Um, men tend to attach higher valuations to um, YouTube, um, Google Maps. Um, uh, Twitter, um, again, no surprise, I guess, um, uh, Skype, but also going to, to, to the cinema. So some of them um, more than others, obviously, but, you know, it's quite interesting, I think, to, to think about the distribution um, across gender here um, as well. I think, um, as expected, there's very minimal differences, or not expected, but, you know, there's minimal differences for TV, online banking, going to the park, or, or Spotify, there seems to be almost no difference between uh, uh, women and men. Okay, um, as I said, we did some regression analysis on this as well. Um, here I'll show you just an example for, for fa Facebook and the evaluation for, for 12 months. Um, so we, we looked at dummy variables for, um, for uh, gender, for um, education, different age groups, we control for regions here. And still, you know, quite a lot of the things or the intuitions that we've been showing with the general uh, valuations are still coming through. So it's confirming um, a lot. For example, here you can see that the valuation of women for Facebook seems to be um, a robust to controlling for all, a whole bunch of other um, um, other things, um, uh, including including regional dominance that we that we have included um, here. Interestingly, the the you know that then we can start digging into data as much as we want, cutting it either way. If you control for degree, for example, um, the valuation for Facebook seems to be quite considerably lower, um, so up to um, six hundred pounds in the, in the in the last um, specification here on the right hand side, and then that's quite quite interesting. We, we need to look into some of those a bit more and see what other people have found um, uh, on 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 these. Um, and just, you know, for example, one interesting finding that came out from this analysis that um, if you dig into the regions, then the value of, of, of parks seems to be uh, much, much higher for people that are living in London than people that are living outside of London, which I guess makes sense because, you know, that that's the green space you get um, if you're living in a, in, in a big city. Okay, um, the impact of COVID-19, um, you know, that that, that was really, um, quite interesting because we ran at the end of February and then suddenly, you know, the country went into lockdown. We thought, okay, we really need to um, run this again. And with the help of um, the ONS, we were luckily um, able to, to, to do that then in mid-May. And you can see, you know, some changes which are really quite expected. For example, the valuations for online grocery shopping increased by 130% across the population. Um, and, and as well, um, I'm sorry, uh, increased for 130% for people aged 65 and above, but they increased for, for everyone, but not as much as for, for people that, you know, are, are, are older. And I think that makes a lot of sense because you might be shielding um, uh, more and trying to stay at home and try to do your shopping um, online, which you might not have done um, before or not even thought about doing it. And the same is for Facebook, you know, that increased quite a lot for, for older generations. I can certainly um, confirm that from my own experience. Um, they know that a lot of um, uh, people, you know, that are older actually got onto um, social media, and that that's quite an interesting one. Now, if we dig down, um, and I'm not going to dwell on these findings too much here across social grades, for example, which is a combination of education, income, and region. Um, then online learning increased by almost 400% for people of the low social grade. Now, I found that quite quite interesting, quite encouraging to, to see. Um, that you know this group that you know might have not attached very high valuations to to online learning beforehand suddenly started to realize the, the potential of that and I think 
at some of the powers of, of, of the digital economy. Um, um, yeah, so the, we, we looked into gaming, for example, online learning, LinkedIn, they all seem to have increased for, for women the most. Um, parks increased for younger people. Um, I guess they might have not gone to the park as much before, but you know, if that was the only thing you can do, then suddenly um, that, became, that became an option. Obviously, the value of printed news went down as the value of online news went down. If you look on the right hand side here, you know, it's really interesting to see that the correlation um, between the change in the valuations and change in usage rates is very high. So, you know, th those, those goods that increased the most in terms of how many people are using it also increased the most in terms of the average um, uh, valuations. Now, the video here. If um, the consumer surplus changes, so I mean that that's really now we, we're getting to some of the discussions of, of the of the implications of what we're what we're finding here. Um, but you know, for many of those goods, take Facebook or take Instagram, the the price stays the same, right? And that's usually how we assess um, um, the, the the value of something. Is like how many how much people are willing to pay for it. Problem is if if the price is fixed at at, at zero um, or almost zero for for some of them, um, and and the consumer welfare seems to increase um, even over a short period of time of, of of ten weeks. What does that say about you know um, a market based measures such as GDP, um, and and unfortunately it's being used as a measure of of um, of welfare. So it, it really raises some of these important questions that, you know, if we can't use prices that we can observe in the market to assess how much pe how much value people attach to certain goods and services, um, because those prices simply don't exist or don't change very much, but the average um, consumer surplus does change, you know, what does that mean about, what does that mean for, for, for our measures of, um, of the economy? And do we need to start thinking about um, other um, aggregate measures that might capture those um, in, a, in a better way, and we certainly we certainly think so. Okay, um, two more issues. I'm going to talk about time inconsistencies and the um, adding up constraints. Some of those were hinted at by Diane already um, before. So time inconsistencies. Um, on the right hand side, you can see the ratio um, between those people that got um, asked about giving up access for 12 months as opposed to, uh, to those that were asked to give up access for one month. So we randomly split um, the sample in half and allocated 50% um, of, of respondents were asked, okay, give up access for 12 months as opposed to, to one month. And, um, you know, if, if, if you would think rationally, then obviously if you multiply the monthly valuation by 12, you should get to to the annual valuation, but it doesn't really seem to be the case um, because overall um, people um, tend to undervalue the, the, so 12 months, 12 times the monthly rate seems to be much lower than, than, than the, annual, um, the annual valuation that people attach to that. So then the question is for us, do, do people overvalue um, short periods of time, so, so one month, or do you undervalue longer periods of time when you have to consider the next 12 months, and I think um, we're not there yet in terms of saying what, what, what this was, and I think we need some, some more research um, into that. The interesting thing is that for certain goods, such as email, TV, or grocery shopping, um, gaming, or online search, which are obviously highly integrated into our everyday lives, um, they, are, they seem to be very high, um, very time consistent. So actually 12 times the monthly value that people attach to that, do more or less look like the, um, the annual valuation. And certainly when you consider um, the confidence intervals that which were also computed, then those certainly look exactly the, um, the same. So, so it's qu quite interesting to think about, you know, how people actually start um, to add up um, these things. So how do, you, how do you think about the value? Do we think about it at, at, on, a, on a monthly basis or weekly basis? Um, and actually in one of our pilots, we found that, you know, Conceptually, for a lot of people, um, the week almost looks like a month. So the valuations there were quite, um, quite similar, and and so we do need to think about, you know, by running these kinds of surveys, what period do we ask people about, um, and what what do we want people to consider here? 
The second one is um, the adding up constraints. So you, you might say, okay, so we have certain social media services here, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. Can we just add all of them up and come up with a um, accurate uh, value of social media um, across the population? And if we do that just for the five um, social media um, services that we ask people here, we get around 3,000 pounds um, per year, right? That people would demand uh, for giving up access to, to those. Of course, there's, there's lots of issues with that. For example, many services are missing, right? So some, some people might be using something else which is not uh, represented here, which is alleviated a bit by the fact that we, you know, started looking at how much time people spend on these um, services and how many users do we have, and that's how we chose um, what we what we ask people about. But then we can ask the question, okay, should we ask people about, for example, all social media? And and the problem is then that, you know, it becomes really difficult to compare products over time. That's something that we really want to be able to do. Um, you know, if, if, for example, quality changes of certain, of certain good, then that will be captured um, if we ask about specific um, services. The other problem is that we actually, it, it's difficult to define what, what a social media of often these things span certain um, categories and it's going to be more and more difficult if, if things like WhatsApp start getting into payment services and so on, it's going to be a bit more uh, problematic. Um, if you look at figures from Ofcom, then here you can see that the average revenue per user um, for all social media was estimated to be just around 45 pounds per year in 2018. So obviously nowhere uh, near the high valuations that people uh, place on these services. Probably most people will be willing to pay 45 pounds uh, to use social media, any kind of social media for, for one year, but you know, that's another question. And, and online search alone, as I said before, is around 3,100 pounds um, that people attach to that. And the average revenue per user is, is, is just around 100 pounds according to, to Ofcom figures. So again, we need to think about this discrepancy in terms of um, how much do we measure if, if these things change um, over time. And, and the final point is here really, um, what is the budget constraint we should consider? Because despite being, being free, you can see that quite a large number of people are still not willing to use it. Right? So I give you something for free, but you still not start using it. So there must be some sort of cost involved. And we think that um, that's obviously the time that you have to put into it as well as selling your personal data. And some people might not be um, willing to do that um, in exchange for, for getting something for free in that sense. So we, we just need to think very carefully about, you know, um, how can we add all of those up and what's the budget constraint that people face when, when they actually um, start, cons um, start um, considering which services to use and which ones not. Just having a lot of time. Um, as a robustness check, then we uh, looked at best worst scaling um, um, questions. So basically, that's another way to get to, to the valuations and look at the ranking or the importance that people attach to certain goods um, as opposed to money. For So we, we chose um, uh, seven, um, seven products here or seven goods and randomly assigned um, earning less, so a decrease in earnings for each um, for each respondent. And by that, we could see basically if we ask someone, would you rather give up um, email or um, uh, earning 5,000 pounds less per year? We can see, okay, which choice does a person make? But um, how does that change? For example, if we con uh, ask you to consider get earning only 50 pounds or 10 pounds less per year, then obviously you can kind of see, okay, um, where do people um, start making choices? pro or against um, losing income as opposed to losing access, uh, for example, to Wikipedia. And uh, we found that most people are willing to give up Facebook and Wikipedia first before all other things and always keep access to email and their income. Okay, just to conclude then, um, and I hope I didn't skip any questions for clarification, but I think we're almost there so we can kind of um, address those afterwards. Um, we think that online service are, uh, surveys are um, a viable tool. They, they really do change, uh, elicit the changes um, that people have in terms of valuations. And they're highly scalable. So 
um, they can be implemented quite easily and, and cheaply and implemented on a regular basis. So if you want to run them um, every month, you, you could do that uh, for a certain sample of people. And it's quite easy to add uh, categories of, of, of products as they come up. You can add certain products or drop them if no one is using them anymore. And you can easily change valuation bands as, for example, um, incomes change over time. So it's really easy to, to expand those. Um, of course, willingness to accept measures are fairly high. Um, they focus on, um, so, so we, we kind of uh, urge everyone to focus on the changes o over time rather than say, okay, what's the value of Google search? Oh, it's 3,000 pounds, you know, but actually what we're really interested in is like, how does that change over time? Um, um, what, what, how much people um, value those. For example, just over 10 weeks, we all already could see quite considerable changes in, in valuations for, for some of those. Um, medians are generally uh, more, more intuitive because um, you know, some users might have very, very high um, valuations. So we, we also would urge people to look at, at um, medians here, as well as these rankings based on best worst scaling. Um, is one of the first studies that actually looks at very detailed individual characteristics and that's based on the kind of survey format we, we, we chose for this. So working with YouGov, we can actually get quite a lot of characteristics of the individual. And it's one of the first studies to do this kind of things outside um, the United States. Um, as I showed before, valuations differ across socioeconomic groups. Um, and also the device actually matters. So we did control for whether people took the survey on a, on a laptop or a desktop computer or on a mobile device and it tend to be higher for mobile um, devices. Okay, I'm just gonna go through some of the future work that we're planning on this. Um, as we said in the beginning, we think that the GDP welfare wedge is um, increasing as we just really start thinking about whether it's time to adopt new measures, at least when thinking about, you know, what's the welfare well-being of people rather than um, relying too much on GDP, which is obviously an important measure of market um, activity. And the question here is obviously, do we want to be approximately right or precisely wrong? Um, we think there's no um, possibility to, you know, come up with an aggregate measure of welfare if you don't explicitly account for the distribution. And I think here is really where our insights in terms of distribution across age, gender, um, region, and so on come in are really, really quite important. And, you know, everyone that comes up with a new measure needs to um, start accounting for those. Budget constraint, obviously, is a key, key issue. Um, another issue is um, there's no accounting framework so far, or actually not even a real theory that kind of would allow us to consistently aggregate all of those things um, up. And I think that connects to point three here in terms of the budget constraint, you know, what, what, what is it that we try to aggregate um, against? For now, we need just much more testing of different um, uh, groups of goods and people and countries um, to kind of start, um, you know, getting a bit more insights and uh, on the methods as well. Um, and we're happy to talk to all of you if you want to do something in, in your country on those. Um, and finally, then what's the universe of goods, you know, what, what, do we choose from we opted for usage and 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 um, um, and, and number of, um, of, of amount of time spent on on these services and I think that's quite a quite an important uh, sorry important um, yeah and we think you know probably it makes sense to compare those to some offline goods such as such as park here I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here before we're running too much over over time thank you very much please get in touch um, with us and we're looking forward to to your questions. Thank you very much, Diane and David, um, for what I would consider to be a very interesting, fascinating presentation. I like the fact that it's got an evidence base, that really helps. But what's also interesting is how quickly our behaviors and our tastes and our valuations are changing. Uh, that adds another dimension to the dialogue. I think it's worth adding, this is really pertinent information and analysis in terms of it will feed into the SNA system of national accounts research agenda. Uh, there's a lot of discussion on the impact of free goods and services. I like the way you linked to particular products like the uh, online papers, the off, uh, offline printed versions. 
Um, but also I think it's fascinating, a slightly different dimension is that in the past year, all these platforms have survived with a huge increase in demand. So the internet survived, Facebook, the grocery online websites, etc. So has the valuation of platforms increased? How do we value communication and the sharing of information through such tricky times? Um, the ability to walk in a park, is it leisure, pleasure, or do we try to estimate a value on that? I mean, that's very difficult. And then the final thing I wanted to say was obviously the rural, urban and city agenda is really important um, to see if we can delineate that. And on the various analyses you did, I think that will be really useful. So I think questions have come in quite smoothly and consistently in the last 10 minutes. I'll start with the first one. I'll ask David Walrock to, we'll, we'll, we will unmute you if you can ask your two questions uh, reasonably quickly because the questions are increasing so we can give Diane and um, David a chance to answer. I'm just checking if we can unmute David. Okay. He must not be able to, to okay. guess. D David's asked, thanks Sarah. David's asked, is there any concern given survey respondents a list of valuations that they may over report the WTA? And there's a ch issues of the discrete choice binary experiments and argues that this produces more unbiased numbers. And then linking to the welfare changes in the context of social media, some literature suggests mixed effects for increased use, both positive and negative effects. Any thoughts, Diane? Sure, let me start. Um, we obviously worried about the biases and we took a different approach to other papers in this literature. We were thinking about this from the perspective of statistical production, so it has to be reasonably quick, straightforward, not too costly. Um, the um, as you have seen from the results, we got quite a lot of zeros and very low um, figures as willingness to accept valuations. Um, we thought there was um, obviously a risk of hypothetical bias, but uh, probably not so much a strategic bias in this context. The medians weren't out of line with other studies in the literature. And um, as David described towards the end there, we did the robustness check. Um, it's obviously a good point, and I put much more weight on, on the rankings and the kinds of um, consistency we saw there and the, and the best worst scaling results as, as a result of that. But I, I don't think it means that you can't use this kind of approach and get some meaning out of it. Okay. Oh, on the, on the Facebook question, sorry. Um, I think that's a really interesting point. If you're thinking about welfare in the round, um, there are collective effects and even individual effects uh, that are negatives. There's a nice study, um, I forget the authors, but recently looking at, um, they took Facebook away from people for a month and their valuations subsequently had dropped significantly. And um, obviously there are societal harms that come from some of these um, platforms that we might want to think about if we're thinking about an aggregate wealth initiative. David? I think I think I think that that was a good good answer to that. Um, I mean, I think um, you know, I mean, as I tried to express before, there's there's obviously a lot of a lot of substitutes and complementarities going on here. So I mean, if you think about taking away Facebook, I might go to another social social media network. So you know, it's important to actually start um, thinking about you know um, how, how do we um, how, how do we con consider those things and. Of course, you know, if you have a very large network such as Facebook, then taking away access um, in and on itself might be quite quite important because simply of the network effect of, of everyone um, being there. But yeah, I don't have much um, more to add on that. Okay. Um, we're going to try to see if we can unmute Maria Savona next. Oh, thank you. And I just... Um... What a question. Thank you, um, David and Diane. This was fascinating, really. Um, I was intrigued by the, the 
the fact that you compare uh, a, a pure public good like like um, a public parks with um, what I was considering a sort of misleading free digital good like Facebook, and I was wondering whether the, you had any hint on on individual perception of that. Uh, in other words, whether whether these are really comparable to some extent, and also I was wondering whether among the um, offline good, um, you looked more in depth into the now so-called essential services, which are uh, pretty much um, not the, you know not worked on remotely, but um, but increase their perceived value after the after the lockdown. So whether you had any information on that, I hope it makes sense. Thanks. I think before I hand over to Diane and David, can we get Nicola on uh, unmute? Because it's a similar delineation type theme question, but a slightly different focus. Nicola doesn't seem to be on the call anymore. So summarising what Nicola was coming from is the furlough scheme. So obviously people on furlough and not on furlough would make a difference. And would that be linked to social grade, lower social grades and higher social grades? Um, so again, that's a, a delineation thing. So Diane? Yeah, they're great, great questions. Um, so we included public parks partly to get that comparison with um, non-digital free goods. But I think one of the questions this raises is if you're interested in consumer surplus in the aggregate, then why would you not include other kinds of public public goods? And, and it extends that question that David raised at the end about what's the right universe of goods to be thinking about here. Um, I think it would be interesting to look at other um, uh, valuation approaches to green space in particular. ONS has this fantastic work on hedonic um, valuations of access to green space and perhaps we could get some insight from comparing those uh, but I would want to think a lot more about um, what else we might want to want to include and, and think about and what other comparisons might be interesting to make because we'd set this up before we knew there was going to be a pandemic we didn't include other kinds of questions about um, key workers or, or furloughing um, maybe we should be thinking about that if we can go back and do another wave in February. Um, but again, I'd, I'd need to think about that a bit more about in terms of how to structure it. Uh, you know, this, the kind of bottom line is that I think we got quite a lot of insight out of what we did, but it also raised a lot more questions that we're going to have to think about in future work. And um, Nicola and, and Maria have you know, put their fingers on some of those. David? Yeah, I mean, I mean, this reminds me a bit of some conversations I had with uh, Kevin Fox, who I'm happy to see he was on the call as well, on like trying to, you know, include a whole other range of, of, of stuff that's, you know, in the in, in the real economy and start, you know, working out many more of these of these substitutions. I think, um, yeah, I mean, essential services, social care and so on is an obvious one, obvious one, uh, which is often home produced and that's, you know, could be could be included. Um, um, here and Nukoma's question on uh, social grades. I think, um, you know, I mean, as we just said, we've set this up beforehand. So, um, so we, we kind of had the data on what, what income people have or in what income bracket um, they are. And obviously, there are changes. So, we're fully aware that, you know, income might actually affect your level of valuation. Having said that, you know, uh, for some of them, we, we could still see that valuations are highest for people with. With lower uh, with lower incomes, for example, for for, for social media um, such as Facebook and so on. So, um, and and we can control for um, for income in in our regressions, and you know the results still still come through. But yeah, it's a good point to think about. Okay, we could look at the demand curves by um, uh, social grade because between different goods, the elasticity of the valuations with regard to the change in quantity has quite different um, profiles, and um, we can look at that for the different income levels or social grades. It's a really good thought. I must admit, when we talk about Facebook and some of the items like that, that's probably 
challenging enough but when we talk about whether we walk a mile in a park or five miles in a park it's a subjective personal evaluation it's almost like sleep if somebody sleeps for me does that work or does someone work walk on my behalf so yeah this is interesting stuff i'm gonna ask kevin if he can if we can get him to unmute but kevin can you put both your questions together please okay Cool. Uh, thanks very much. This is um, it's, it's great to see this work um, come to fruition like this. Uh, so congratulations, uh, Diane and David, uh, for this, um, this great paper. Um, first, just a comment about the welfare re reducing aspects of social media. There is quite a lot of evidence on that now, but my co-authors, um, Avi Kolis and Felix Eggers, have a, a paper where they don't find that. So I think the, the jury's still out on whether social media use reduces or increases welfare. Um, so uh, a couple of questions here about this issue about um, you know, asking people to give up for 12 months or a, a month. Um, so what, what our issue with, uh, with that and the work that I did with Eric Brynjolfs and Avi Kolas, Felix Eggers and um, Owen Dewart, what the problem we had with that um, was that if we ask people to give up Facebook for 12 months, they've just set up, and we made it incentive compatible so we'd trace them, is that they've just set up another account. Uh, so that didn't, they weren't really giving it up. Um, and there's a possibility when you ask people to give something up for 12 months, even if they do give it up, uh, they may switch to something which is a very close substitute from their point of view. So that could be one reason why you're getting these lower valuations when you're asking to give it up. 12 months versus uh, one month, uh, that people just you know, switch, either they set up a new account or they switch to a, a close substitute product. Um, so I wonder if you've, you've given that some thought. And the other issue is, um, you know, you, there's very much a focus on uh, welfare in this paper and, and sort of setting that out for you, uh, looking at in the future. But there is also this issue about just cap, trying to capture this real consumption of these free goods that's going on uh, in GDP, uh, because this is, you know, it is real consumption of goods. It's just that the price is zero, uh, or is being measured as zero, and so that's why it's being excluded. Um, so you don't need to introduce, say, consumer surplus, you just need to measure the actual real consumption, and I, I know you're aware of my work on, on that. So. I wonder if you have any ideas on that and how you move forward with your work um, to get the appropriate time series of valuations so you can start looking at implementing that over time. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. I'll, I'll let David, I'll let David, thank, yes, thank you, Kevin. Um, and thank you for staying up so late to listen to us. I think okay. I'll let David um, answer on the 12 month issues. Um, on this real consumption question, something I'm really interested in exploring is the thing that we could measure is the time people spend on these different activities and we would get a proper budget constraint and we could think about valuing that in the way that you value household production and that might be um, the, the way uh, an alternative way to think about that that real consumption element of it in your the second part of your question there um, we talked a bit to Leonard Nakamura and I'd like to take that work forward on, on that front yeah, th thanks a lot, Kevin. Um, and, you know, I, I think a few points on, on, on this. The interesting thing is, is really that, you know, for some goods, actually 12 months do look like 12 times one month. And, you know, we do need to think about why that is. And I think, you know, um, it, obviously, if you ask someone to give up access to, to a TV, sure, you might go out um, and buy a new one or something. But, you know, it's not really about that because we're really about... Um, the the changes of asking like different people in, in in a year's time and how much value they attach um to a tv, a TV and, and if the sample size is really big then you know that that change should be um uh quite quite insightful but yeah i mean i think it's an interesting point to think about you know t um if you actually make it incentive compatible and that's one of the problem apart from from the logistics and the cost involved is that you know people might actually uh, start cheating the system um, and they have a real incentive to cheat it uh, because here um, they're actually getting money to to give up access you don't have a real incentive to cheat um, our survey because we're not paying you for it um, so you might as well say uh, say the truth 
But yeah, it's a good point. Thanks. Thanks. For I can that. see in the questions. In the questions, Martin has some interesting points about the time adding up issue also. So thank you, Martin. I think um, I've got to put in a plug here for the audience. The ONS is doing a lot of work on the time use side in collecting the data electronically, and this will be really useful, and not just sort of irregularly, but quarterly. So the time use is a really key input to this work and a range of other pieces of work. I am, I'm going to ask Martin if we can get Martin, we are unmuted, but Martin, if you can quickly put your comments together. I know you've made three, but in the spirit of time, um, please go ahead. Yes. Okay. Well, certainly. And thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I suppose I found myself wondering how different you know, the results would be if you looked at things people pay for. And as I get older, central heating becomes something that's worth to me a lot more than uh, I pay for the heating. Uh, so there's large consumer surplus there. Now, you may find that with some items that people pay for, the consumer surplus changes over time. And I don't just mean seasonally, but there's a trend in it. On the issue of time dependence, uh, I mean, I can see in some circumstances it would be quite rational that giving up you know, your television set in the short term would perhaps disrupt normal routines in the long term. Well, it's not hard to imagine that you would think of things that aren't television that might substitute for it as people used to do other things before we had television. Uh, the other way round, giving up hot water for one day wouldn't trouble me, but giving it up for a month in the winter would. So this time dependence isn't necessarily a sign of irrationality, but I can certainly see you need, you'd like to explore it more. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I think that point is correct about our pilots where we asked the same people about different time periods, but in the main survey, um, uh, people were allocated randomly to be asked about one month or 12 months, so it was different people. But we can look at the, um, we can do a compare and contrast across the pilot results and the main results. Uh, thanks, Martin. And maybe a quick comment on, on the kind of s s consumer surplus changing over time as, as people age. And I think that, that there's really two interesting dimensions here. So obviously, yes, I think for some that might, you know, increase for for other goods that might decrease over time is, you know, some, some things get used um, less. But I think in a way that, you know, people that are very, um, in, have digital services very integrated in their life now, you know, it's likely that they're going to continue a lot of that um, going forward. So just as old generations now have TV very integrated in their lives, um, I've, I've never owned a TV, for example, right? So in that sense, I think, you know, as people get older, then, you know, I don't see myself buying TV at some point. So I think, you know, that that's why we found it very important to actually uh, control for individual characteristics and have a large sample, which allow us to, to look at the kind of uh, demographics, uh, for example, across, across these questions. But yeah, it's, 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 it's a good point. Just want to check with, thanks for that, David and Diane. I just want to check with Sarah. Are we okay for another five minutes? Because we've got this is an interesting topic and lots of questions. I'll try to group some there. Yes, yes, you could keep going for five minutes. Okay, thanks. There's a number of questions I think coming through with slightly different approaches, but the underlying theme is the valuations. So I don't know if you want to add some of the challenges on the valuations. There's a link to the time, paid time, personal time. And there's a nice question that's come through in terms of from Rachel about some of the activities that you focused on are the re reasonably safe in the pandemic phase, but have you thought about asking questions about newly unavailable activities like in-person school? And obviously we know the education impact in the country, this country alone. Diane? Um, the answer on that is no, again, because we didn't know what was going to happen when we set up the survey. Um, but I think Rachel's question, and also just scrolling down Bart's question about free inputs, um, turn on these issues about household work and um, time use and um, uh, very direct measures through time accounting of inputs and outputs which I'm really interested in in pursuing further um, 
I did do a paper a little while ago, it was one of the earlier ESCO papers that got published in Economica about um, the, the, the way that digital activities are making the production boundary a bit, a bit fuzzier than uh, it has been previously. Yeah, not, not, much, not much to add to that. I think it's an interesting point to, to, you know, to, to consider um, in, 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 uh, in, in schooling, like homeschooling and so on. Um, and the power of these kind of methods is that, you know, for the next wave, we can easily say, okay, let's add a question on that because it seems to be, um, seems to be really important. And then we start building up a time series on, on it. Okay. I just want to respond to Keisha, but I think the paper and the presentation will be on the ESCO website. And uh, Diane, David, do you want to confirm that? The confirm. presentation, I think, already is, and the paper will be as soon as we uh, can process it and get it up there. Okay, it's an interesting uh, question. I'm gonna, can we unmute Lucas Rachel, please? Lucas, if you want to ask your question. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for a great uh, presentation. Um, my question was about uh, the sort of blurring of the boundary between what's, what people pay for and what they don't. So people pay for Netflix and, and at least part of people pay from Spotify for Spotify. So I guess I wanted to get your views on whether these are fundamentally different from Facebook, because in all other respects, they seem very similar. And relatedly, your, your results suggest that if Facebook was going to charge the price, they could make a lot more money, potentially. So then the question is, why don't they charge the price? And if they did, would you think the measurement concerns would sort of disappear or at least in part be alleviated? Thank you. Before you start on that, Diane and David, can I just bring in Jack Coy on a sort of similar theme? Jack, do you want to? Uh... Jack is no longer on the call. Okay, right. so off you go, Diane and David. And then I think we might. Have to, I'll have to summarise and draw a line. Okay. I think these are great questions, and I don't actually know the answers to them. It's why we put in this different mix of free and paid for, and different kinds of free and online and offline. Just start trying trying to dig into some of this. Hmm. Um, so you know this this does confirm the standard finding in the literature that willingness to pay is lower than willingness to accept and in some cases much much lower mm. and so facebook will draw the conclusion that if they could did have to charge um then it would be much less than that av average or even me median willingness to accept um I, I think we just need to carry on trying to understand these substitutions and um the relationship between these different kinds of goods David might have a better answer. No, no. I actually, no. It, it, this is this points that we really need to, you know, think or we are thinking about more. I mean, obviously, I mean, I, I would challenge a bit the 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 insight that Facebook would start making more money if they would start charging for it. I, I'm not so sure because I think you know a lot of people might not um, use it anymore. So in a way, the business model is really driven by monetizing whatever they do in a, in a different way. Um, I think some of the measurement issues would go away if they would charge a price, um, but you know, I mean, it, it, not not all of them. And um, Spotify, I think, is an interesting point here because it has this freemium business model where you know you can actually listen to all of it for free. You just have to listen to ads sometimes, um, as, or, or you can pay pay for that. So um, again, you know, it would be interesting to start uh, comparing. Uh, you know, some people that are using it versus people that. That are not and you know netflix is an interesting point as the ceo of netflix said a few years ago um they're not competing with amazon or apple tv they're competing with sleep and you know that really uh, <laughs> you know it triggered a lot in my thinking and when i thought okay actually you know time seems to be the real constraint that that you know um you're trying to get people to spend as much time on your platform as opposed uh to another um to another platform and obviously they will be monetizing other stuff and in, in addition to the eight pound ninety nine that they're charging you to to watch the content and a lot of the money will go to the producers as well. Yeah, I just want to add one final thing on to on that last strand. Things like Wikipedia and some of these you know, organizations ask for voluntary contributions if you want. And I know some pop groups had uh, when they released their albums, they raised a lot of money by people willingly, voluntarily paying money. I'm not saying there's a substitute cost. 
but it was interesting to see people's behavior that they were willing to pay maybe less but still willing to pay okay thank you very much for all the questions and the spirit of time i apologize for the few questions that are still there but i think we got the 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 thrust of the themes that are there uh thank you again to diane and david very very interesting stuff and good luck with your future efforts in this area um Thank you to the audience. I'd just like to say th this is the penultimate webinar in this COVID-19 series this year. There's one more on the 10th of December by Carlis Kanders, who's from Nesta, and they'll be covering mapping career causeways for workers displaced by automation during the COVID phase. And automation is another area like free goods and services that's going to be around for a long, long time. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you and enjoy the rest of the day wherever you are in the world. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. Right.